hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I want to get to the announcements of the winners because it was so cool to watch the, some of the prelims and the final presentations today. But I definitely want to share a couple of lessons that I've learned both in scaling companies globally from being very tiny, highly franchised, highly fragmented, to organizing them and scaling them to now the, the work that I do in the startup community. So when I was uh, nine years old, I had my first business lesson, and it was when my mom came to me and said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving. And what she meant was we were leaving my father. Um, we, uh, my father was a really good man, a really sweet man, but a bad father and a bad husband. He was an extreme alcoholic. And so at the age of nine, the oldest of three girls, my mom decided it was time for us to leave. And when I was nine years old, when she told me that, I did not cry. I didn't get upset and ask what would happen. My response to her at the age of nine was, what took you so long? And the business lesson in that is that the people who are closest to the action, the consumer, the customer, the user, whatever that is, know what the right thing to do is long before you ever know what it is or have the courage to take action on it. And so the trick in business, whether it's tiny business or big business, is staying really close to that action. Whether it's you personally, or a team of researchers, or the way you connect and crowdsource input and really keep that feedback loop going. It doesn't matter how small or how big you are. The reality is, bless you, the answers for whatever the next thing is, or the next iteration of what you're doing is, the answers already exist. The group who wins will be the ones that mine that the most effectively and are able to respond as quickly as possible. So that was my first business lesson from my awesome single mom. And then as I grew up, I got to watch her, and she fed our family of three girls on a food budget of $10 a week for three years. And so, and it's not like I'm talking about 1920 where, you know, $10 a week was, you know, a million dollars today. Because this was in the 80s. And so, to watch that, I grew up with this just belief system that the whole, you know, anything is possible. But I grew up with a very low bar of what resources you need in order to make something happen. And so I tell people I am unfairly advantaged in business, global business and entrepreneurship because my belief system around what is possible with how little is required to make that into a reality is so different than the average person from the developed world. And that is a gift and it's an advantage and I learned to use it to my benefit, even as a young executive. Whenever people would say, well, we can't do it, we need more money, more time, more resources, more access, my mom used to always say that I was like water, which would mean when I would hit a wall, instead of just hitting it and banging my head against the wall and continuing to try or curling back, I would run along the surface of the wall until I found a crack and would slide it. And that is what has allowed what we've done. At Cinnabon to be incredibly successful. We just hit 1.5 billion in consumer product revenues which is a pretty exciting milestone for us. And, uh, and that's with 1,200 franchise locations and 70,000 points of retail distribution of our products. And we haven't even launched e-commerce yet. That is coming in 2015. And so that's because of that mentality about being like water. It's this concept that there's always a way. You've just got to run along those hard walls and those hurdles and then find the crack and slide in, which means you've got to be insanely resilient, very creative, <coughs> open, and collaborative. At Cinnabon, I've learned to apply those messages in a way that gives us guardrails. And so one of our rules is if we don't, our competition will. That's rule one. We always remember that. So even if a venture is scary or seems uh, to really be a big drain on resources, we keep in our mind that if we don't, our competition will. But the contradictory statement that frames that and gives us guardrails instead of weights around our ankles is just because we can does not mean we should. So if we don't, our competition will. But just because we can, and just because the competition might, does not mean that we should. And we have a series of filters and processes where we determine where on the side of the spectrum should we lean for any given initiative. And I learned that from watching my mom, and I learned that from being like water. There's always a way. The question is, how long do you need to run along that wall until you find the crack? And do you have the appetite for that? Do you have the financial wherewithal and the access to capital for that? So I grew up in that family environment, started working at the age of 15. Uh, in malls, selling clothes, and then started working at Hooters restaurants as a hostess when I was in high school. Turned 18 in high school, uh, became a Hooters girl, and graduated was the first person in my family to ever get accepted into college on either side of my family. And I had big dreams. I started as an electrical engineering and computer sciences major, and my plan was to actually go work for a large chemical company and go to law school and become an attorney. 
and I had seen a paint can that said DuPont on it when I was a kid. We were really poor, but we had a paint can. We were like painting a garage or something. And I said, oh, that must be a big company. I want to go work for them. And so I set my sights on in engineering, computing sciences, and then eventually law. Funny things happen when you have your sights somewhere out here, but life still happens in between here and there, what that thing is. And clearly, I'm not doing that today. And so uh, I started working at Hooters, and when I got into college, I was paying my way through college. I had a partial scholarship, but I had to work all the time. And I set the record for close opens. And if you don't know what that is in the restaurant industry, that means you stay and close the restaurant and the bar until 1 or 2 a.m. until it's clean, and you get your ass back at 10 a.m., and you open it again. You literally do that back-to-back, -back, and I did that 26 days in a row and uh, between semesters. And, but I needed the money. And so to me, it's always been this equation of what are you willing to risk and invest in order to get that reward? It's really super simple. It's risk reward, it's trade offs, it's understanding that everything you want in the world is simply an equation. And some of the variables in the equation you already have at a high value, some you have at a low value. And I looked at myself that way as well. I knew that I came from an alcoholic father, a single parent. I worked at Hooters most of my professional career. And by the way, I ended up dropping out of college my second year. And so on paper, I was a train wreck. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew that those variables that added up success, there were some that I was low on. Pedigree, experience, formal education, age, and just really from having access to learnings throughout the time in the industry. So I was low on those variables. So it was my job to be high on all the other variables in order to achieve the same or higher end result of the equation, which meant working my ass off, taking the jobs that no one wanted, trying to be as curious as possible, but volunteering my time in industry organizations, nonprofits, anything that I could to learn. If an organization offered a three-letter certificate that I could actually use to make it seem like I learned something and had learned something, I would get. I think I had nine three-letter acronyms after my name on my business card. That meant no, nothing to anyone except to me because it allowed me to learn. And what really ended up happening, I did that because I wanted to learn, but the end result was an insanely deep and meaningful network of people in the industry, people in the community, and I was helping a lot of people do a lot of things, and all of a sudden, I realized my name was being thrown around in circles to run businesses, to start working in private equity firms, to buy and sell companies. I never had that intention. It was just the output of my effort over time because I was honest about my variables and my equation. I knew what I was low in, and I didn't use that as a barrier. In fact, when I was 19, uh, Hooters Restaurants, which is where I worked at the time, now in my second year in college, they called and said, hey, uh, we're opening our first restaurant in Sydney, Australia. First restaurant in Australia and only second international location. We need a group of 10 people from around the country who are as experienced as possible to go help us open our restaurants. I had never been on a plane. I didn't have a passport. I was this little redneck from Jacksonville, Florida, who had only been out of the city twice by bus for cheerleading competitions. And so my manager came to me and said, I think you're the right person. And you're the right person because when the cooks quit, you went in back and cooked. And you're the right person because when the bartender had to go home early, you went back and learned that job. And when the manager had to go home to take care of her kids, you went back and shut down the restaurant. So without knowing it over the course of six to nine months, you have literally learned how to not only do, but teach every single job in this restaurant. And for that reason, I want you to go. And I didn't do what about 75 to 80% of humans would do, which would be to lay out all the reasons why I can't go. Number one, I can't legally exit the country. It's kind of a problem. Um, <laughs> you know, never done anything like that. And so there are so many people who have that self-talk. Rarely people like you in this room, you're part of the 20 or less percent who just say, I can and I will, despite lack of preparedness. And I was one of those people that said yes. I said yes, and then I figured out that if I flew to Miami that night and stood in line the next morning with all my paperwork, I could get a passport, which is what I did, and then I flew back and called them and said I can go. And so a week later I went to Australia when I was 19, fell in love with opening franchises overseas. I thought it was a once in a lifetime experience, so I did it, came back, made up the classes I missed, and six months later um, they asked me to go to Central America to open the first ever Hooters in Central America in Insurgentes in Mexico. And so I did that, and I came back and I made up those classes, and two months later I opened the first one ever in South America, right before I turned 20 in Buenos Aires, uh, except I was leading the entire opening, sourcing the franchising, sourcing the supply chain, handling all the hiring, marketing, opening the business effectively. And when I came back, of course I was failing college. <laughs> and 
So my professors said, you know, you have a choice. And I love these forks in the road in life. They're super freaky and scary, and, and they're insanely meaningful. And so they said, you can quit college, which is a pretty heavy deal, considering I was the first person ever on either side of my family to get into college. Uh, or you can recommit, and we'll find a way, but you can't work. You can't, not even can you not travel, you can't work in the way that you've been working, because you're going to have to go to school, you know, all days, nights, weekends. And so I quit. I dropped out. I had no assurances that what I was doing would continue, but at least I had a real compelling alternative in the immediate time frame. And so I came back and kept traveling and opening businesses all over the world. It took me to Asia, Africa, literally all over the world. I opened degrees on every continent except Antarctica. <laughs> Um, and there will be there one day, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, maybe different uniforms there. <laughs> so, but it was, there was something really interesting that I also was super clear on about my early time at Hooters. I knew that I was in a company that was growing fast. You know all the quotes you've heard about the tech industry? People say, hey, if you get offered a scene on a rocket ship, don't ask what scene, you know, just get on and go. Um, it was growing. And so being a part of a growing company that acted like a startup with all the problems of a startup, lack of in infrastructure, lack of expertise, lack of proper capital allocation. We were a hot mess in a lot of areas. But we were growing, and people just loved the brand all over the world. And so what I really understood clearly was that the only reason I was getting the chances that I did was because I was willing to do the work that was necessary. And I was also super honest that there weren't Ivy League MBAs beating down the door of leaders trying to become executives. And so I knew that by way of it being fast growth, meaning talent willing to do the work, and not having other compelling alternatives for executive leaders, that that was a great place for me to stay. A lot of people ask why did you leave. I was, I've been recruited most of my career by companies that are much larger and certainly much more publicly legitimate than Hooters are not as controversial. But when I was at Hooters, we bought an airline, ran an airline, sold an airline. How many of you can say that you've done that? I never been a part of it. We were fully vertically integrated. We owned our entire supply chain, manufacturing, direct distribution, marketing, merchandising company. We owned it all, and I helped run those companies. And so when people would ask me, why did you stay there? Like, why would you stay working for Hooters? You're smart. You could do so much more. Why did you do that? And my response was then and still is today, even long after I, I left, was that because my gratitude for all of the opportunities to learn that I got, my gratitude was so much greater than my concern of what anyone thought. It was this ratio, what was more important to me, learning, not a popularity contest. And so the good thing was I got really clear on that super young, so my decisions became incredibly easy because that was the filter through which I passed all decisions. Where will I learn the most? Not where, where will it be the most polished, the best resume, or what will it get me over time. It was just about the variety of learning. I complemented that with a lot of volunteer work, uh, spending a ton of time in Eastern Africa, humanitarian work in Rwanda, Somalia, and Ethiopia, and then volunteering in the U.S. government, <coughs> state government here in Georgia, and leading the industries associations. What that did at the age of 26, when I became the vice president of Hooters, when we hit $800 million in revenue, was to help me live multiple leadership lives. Starting a company is one thing. Being able to rally a team, align them around goals, get a plan to scale, respond to market trends, and then grow with it is a totally different skill set. There was only a tiny bit of overlap. And I didn't have it because I was young and moving fast, more like a startup within a growing company, and I needed to have step change in my leadership capability. And so the way I got that was volunteering in nonprofits. They need leaders, they're resource constrained, you've got to rally people around a goal. It builds a leadership muscle that is incredibly difficult to do in a purely pure profit, for profit uh, company. So I did that for three years. I became the chair of the board at the age of 25 of the Georgia Restaurant Association, the youngest ever board chair of three other large industry nonprofits. And I had to replace two CEOs during that time. And you try replacing CEOs when you're 25 and 26. <laughs> um, but it was. It was awesome because it taught me about the emotional dynamics, the thinking that has to go into evolving and scaling an organization, how legacy leaders and legacy employees, what determines whether or not they're the right person over time, how can you have visibility into that in advance, and then how do you deal with it when you miss it, and then you end up in an uh-oh situation where things aren't necessarily gelling. And I learned that in my mid-20s through nonprofits. And then our CEO died unexpectedly at Hooters. By the way, he was the sole owner, shareholder, stockholder, president, CEO, chairman of the board. So I called him a walking conflict of interest. He would just walk around and go, what do you think about this? That sounds great. Motion. Approved. You know? <laughs> so we did some really stupid things as a 
result of that. Uh, but when he passed away suddenly, our organization went through an incredible amount of turmoil. And in fact, I'm an investor in 10 startups, uh, four tech, six are consumer facing retail, and I've already got situations with two of the startups, one in tech, one in retail, where they're less than three years old, and one of the partners has had a massive issue, personal issue, or some other type of issue, and now things have to be addressed at a partner level. And you don't want to lean on the legal agreement, you want to do things as sort of what's right for the baby, what's right for the brand, what's right for the business, but usually when you're that young and everyone's put a lot of time, effort, potentially money and energy into it, it's not an easy thing to deal with. And all of that work in Hooters and, and the nonprofits and dealing with the transition in leadership has allowed me to be an incredible friend and mentor and advisor and mediator in some cases uh, to these startups. And so I really encourage you if you have the opportunity, not only in your own startups and your own ventures, but in your community to take leadership roles in nonprofits because the shit that you will deal with will prepare you for when it's actually your business on the line if your business right now is not preparing. It'll help you get prepared at a much younger age than it would otherwise create because most people learn these lessons when they're 40 and 50 because they go through life and they go through business and these things happen. If you're trying to fast track your ability to not only be a creative founder, developer, and a leader, you've got to leave some, leave some parallel leadership lives. And so I did that and as a result, I started getting recruited by uh, private equity firms. And they wanted me to come in and help buy and sell companies. I had a little bit of a problem because I basically worked for Hoover's my whole life and was a college dropout. And so if you're a PE firm and you have basic requirements that say what a vice president or a managing partner is supposed to be, I met none of those. <laughs> um, but interestingly, I was leading a political action committee and invited all the CEOs of Georgia-based hospitality companies. And they showed up. And I was doing it because I wanted to rally people around what our industry needed. I don't believe in just being a victim to your industry. I believe in shaping the environment you're in. So if you're going to create a business in a space, you better know what's going on in that space. Be an advocate. Get involved in policy. Whatever you need to do, even if you can't shape it, you'll at least have more visibility into what's coming and you can adjust your business as a result. And so I did that and all of these leaders ended up seeing me take a leadership role and asking me to come run their company. <coughs> and a friend of mine who was a recruiter was there and she leaned over and said, they're all going to want to hire you, but you sort of have this problem that you've got an incredible operating reputation, but on paper you're a hot mess. And so, and she used hot mess before that was even a cool term. And she said, you got to go back to school. And so I, I struggled with that because here I am, I'm, now I was 27 or 28 when that conversation happened. We were about to hit a billion in revenues at Hooters. We had grown to 33 countries and over 500 restaurant locations. And so, I, you know, on the traditional, why do I need an MBA? sort of thought most people will get an MBA in order to get something. I already had the something. I didn't <laughs> need that as a step, but I understood two things. One, I understood that I had only experienced success in one company. So my question was, am I really as good as I think I am? Or have we just been successful here because I've worked every job in this company and I could get anything done with my relationships? And there were only going to be two ways that I would find out if I was really legit. Uh, one way was to go back to school and benchmark my belief systems against best practices. And the other way was going to be to leave and run something else. And that was the only way that I would find out the truth. And one of my focuses as a leader has been all about seeking the truth. The consumer truth, the employee truth, you know, what is not my perception or what I want, not validating my preferences, but really what is the truth. Because that is what will create the most sustainable advantage over time. And so I wanted the true truth, not what people would tell me, not, oh, you're doing a good job, yeah, you could go do this again. I wanted to know. In order to know, I had to put myself in a position to fail. So I found a way to go back, and I got an MBA without a bachelor's. It's pretty rare. Uh, <laughs> very rare. Uh, but I had to go back, take a GMAT with no notice, pass at a certain percentage higher than minimum entrance requirements, so they weren't skimping on the requirements. And bless you, and then I had to get letters, and I got letters from 10 CEOs that I had helped or mentored their leaders over the last 10 years, including Ted Turner. And I don't know if he helped or hurt the application. <laughs> Probably more hurt. Um, but I found a way. Remember that analogy about water? You know, you run along the wall, and there's, there's got to be a way. There's always got to be a way. And so I went to school. Um, it was incredible. But that year, I was the CEO of the Georgia Restaurant Association, selling hooters into private equity because the CEO passed several years prior, and the estate was a mess. And so the judge ruled that we liquidate the most valuable asset in the company, which was Hooters of America. So we had to put our company on the auction block with no notice, which is very emotional when you're that big of a company that's had one owner its entire life, which at that point was 28 years old. And uh, 
So I was selling the company, going back to school to get my MBA, leading the Restaurant Association, did all that through 2009 and 2010. While we were on the road show selling the company, I met more private equity firms and uh, was recruited to come in and go run one of the portfolio companies for Rourke Capital, which is one of the largest uh, private equity firms in the Southeast and certainly in Atlanta. They specialize in the franchise space and um, waste management, but also any type of direct-to-consumer franchise. I've been running the business for four years. We've had four of the best years in year-over-year -year comp sales we've had in a decade. Uh, I mentioned we hit the 1.5 billion consumer product sales mark. When I took over four years ago, that was 600 billion. And so there's been tremendous consumer product sales growth. And that has happened, ironically, because a lot of the lessons you've heard or heard mentioned today, and the guys from YIGAC mentioned something that is so important to me, which is rallying around small wins. No one achieves the big wins because they set that out and as the vision and then they just go up through that and nothing else and have no milestones along the way. With the humanitarian work I do in Eastern Africa, we've learned that you have to focus on things that are small enough to change and big enough to matter. And you should remember that phrase. Small enough to change, big enough to matter. It speaks to risk reward, the value equation. If something's too small, you could invest the same amount of time and resources and get a bigger benefit, whether it's for society or for your business. But if it's too big, the institutional headwinds and the behavioral practices are so concrete that it's really hard. You might change it while you're there, but the minute you turn around, everything form fits right back into place where it was. And so the key is finding the sweet spot of what's small enough to change, big enough to matter. And actually, what's interesting is when you find that thing, so for us, it was focusing on a particular sized village. There was one that was too small that you hate walking past any life, but there was one that's too big that we couldn't change, so we focused on that one that was small enough to change and big enough to matter. And not only did they drive results in pulling out narcotics and improving vegetation and it, being able to support themselves, but the village of 5,000, which was over double the size by the time we came back and the results were there, they were at the middle-sized village buying the seedlings, asking how, and now they were pulling the change instead of having it pushed. The same thing happens with my franchisee. Some of you already have a startup or you're working on it. You might have two partners or three partners or seven investors. I have 250 partners in 60 countries. They are literal partners. They invest their money in the brand. Well, I can't live without them. They can't live without us. And we have to lead through such influence and change management. And that builds a different leadership muscle. And that teaches you to be comfortable with small wins and then build from there. Get something ready and push it out when it's 75% ready, because it's going to change anyway. It's going to change if it's 75% or if it's 100%. So you might, as not, well, you might as not waste your time on the front end. That's true with food, it's true with tech, it's true with retail, and generally it's true with services, and it's true all over the world. And so you want to have that healthy tension. You don't want to be reckless and launch something that could disadvantage a brand and your reputation, but you also don't want to give way to the competition who's comfortable enough and not letting perfect be the enemy of good enough. We use that concept of small enough to change, big enough to matter, with everything from product launches to understanding what our enablers are. So I was in a village uh, three years ago on the uh, Somali border of Ethiopia. And one of my friends had never been to Africa. It's a rough way to experience Africa for the first time. And we asked the village leaders, what, what are your priorities? And he's like taking his notes. And he goes, um, he said, uh, well, you know, I need to know what your priorities are because we're going to go back and raise funds as developing world, developed world people do. And the village leader said, our priority is water. And he goes, great, I don't want water. And then he said, well, what are the others? Because, you know, we can go back to England and America and Australia and raise all these funds. And they laughed and they said, our number two priority is water, our number three priority is water, our number four priority is water. <laughs> and in that moment, although we all sort of joked, I had this deep-seated lesson. You, know, you have those lessons and they burn into your brain and you know it's a lesson right in that moment. You don't even have to think about it afterward. And the lesson was, they are so clear on priorities because the penalty for getting the priorities out of order is death. That is a huge issue in the developed world because the penalties for us getting things out of sequence are just wasted time and money. Now, wasted time and money might be a deal breaker and a business killer for you, but in most cases you can bounce back. And so I thought, how can I create the perception of this high price of mispriced retail? And we said, but in our malls, when you're walking past the Cinnabon, you think there's just one 
giant cinnamon roll there. And there is a giant 880 calorie delicious cinnamon roll there. But there's lots of other stuff too. And so if we launch all these new products and you've got bags in your hands, you're trying to avoid us, not walk to us. You're going, I should go, it smells so good, but I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And so we said, if we launch all these new products, doesn't matter how well they test in consumer testing, I can have them here and you all would eat them and say, we love them, we'll absolutely buy them. And you would never come by our counter to get them. The intention that consumers express is not always the behavior that is realized. And so we realized that the enabler was changing the merchandiser and moving to digital menu boards that showed the product, even the little tiny ones from far away. But we couldn't force our franchisees to adopt this enabler because it wasn't in their contract. So we did a big sell job and went in and said, here's the results, here's why you should do it. 75% of them adopted the enablers, the digital menu boards, and the merchandising display. The other 25 uh, did not, and those that did not only had about a 2% sales increase, and those who did had a 15% sales increase. And this, so this, this concept of enablers is incredibly powerful, and it helped us also weaving in, we're comfortable with small wins. Our CEO at the time was saying, no, you need everybody to do it. Everybody needs to participate before you launch. And we said, no, 50% was sort of our good enough number, 75% was a shocker, and so we ran and drove the business results. Now 99% of the system, of course, has all of those things because just like the village in Africa, they said, well, what are they doing that I'm not? The answer was the enablers, and so they went and asked for it. Of course, they're having to pay double the amount for it now that the early adopters uh, had to pay. And so these concepts of asking yourself, if not me, who, if not now, when, being highly accountable for your work, uh, really thinking about what's small enough to change and big enough to matter, and having super a super degree of comfort for small wins will serve you well in the tiniest business or in the largest business, and it will help pave a path to scalability um, that is littered with a lot less risk than if you don't follow um, follow that advice. So I'm happy to answer questions. You can tweet me, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, any of that. I'm Catpole ATL. And um, I know we want to get on to announcing these awesome winners. So hopefully that helps.